All right, everyone. So welcome back to the part two of the future of AI, social and cultural aspects online lecture series organized by the Digital Society Lab of the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Um, our aim is to bring international experts from different fields to discuss the philosophy of AI, AI and post-digital aesthetics, cultural impacts of AI, AI art, also AI in art, non-human agency, AI-driven social transformation, and generally our coexistence uh, with AI in daily life. So um, in part two, we will have four lectures. I posted in, in, in the chat the link um, with the announcement of all, all four lectures. And we are starting with uh, Joanna Zielinska's uh, lecture, Non-Human Creativity, Artificial Imagination, Human Anticipation. Um, Joanna is a writer, artist, and professor of media philosophy and critical uh, digital practice at King's College in London. And she's the author of um, AI Art, Machine Visions and Warped Dreams, The End of Man, A Feminist Counter Apocalypse, Non Human Photography, and Minimal Ethics for the Anthropocene. Uh, her own art practice involves experimenting with different kinds of image-based media, and she is currently researching perception and cognition as boundary zones between human and machine intelligence, while trying to map out scenarios for alternative futures. And um, her new book, The Perception Machine, Our Photographic Future Between the I and AI, is forthcoming from the MIT Press in November. And we are lucky here to get a sneak peek um, into this book because the, this lecture is partly based uh, on the content of the book. So Joanna, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Yelena. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me, me here. I'm very honored to be part of the series. Let me try and share the screen. And is that working okay? Can you see it okay? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about non-human creativity in relation to artificial imagination and human anticipation. Um, I'll start from saying a few words about AI art. And a lot of work that currently gets produced in the name of AI or AI art is really terrible. In the previous work, I called it artificially intelligent art or a form of candy crush. So in my AI art book, I offered a critique of the rise of machinic creativity driven by AI. The book is freely available, open access. You can download it from Open Humanities Press. And I was particularly rancorous about the seductive yet frequently banal visuality and about how this kind of art principally served as a PR campaign for the A2.0 era driven by Google. So that early outpouring of the visually seductive art included st style transfer works, like of the kind, let's do ourselves a new Rembrandt the way uh, Microsoft did, or some really bad experiments with GANs, let's animate some faces in the style of Francis Bacon or Barbie dolls. However, these imitation experiments open up an interesting debate about our conventionally accepted parameters of authorship, originality, expertise, and taste. The new scientist has raised an interesting question um, uh, and uh, with regard to simulation works by saying, if it is so easy to make ourselves a digital Van Gogh, if it's so easy to break down the style of some of the world's most original composers, writers or artists into computer code, this means that some of the best human artists are more machine-like than we would like to think. So that kind of provocation uh, set me on a journey of exploring some other ways of thinking about uh, creativity today. Now, a similar line of thinking was already offered by a philosopher of technology, Willem Flusser, who argued that since the times of the Industrial Revolution, image makers have existed in a close-knit relationship with their apparatuses, facilitating new kinds of collaborations. For Flusser, it was a new kind of function in which human beings and apparatus merged into a unity. Flusser was writing about photographers, yet his argument extends to other forms of human creativity. This human machinic unity meant for Flusser that humans now function as a function of apparatuses. 
Their creative activity is therefore understood as an execution of the machine's program and involves making a selection from the range of options determined by the algorithm. Importantly, Flusser was writing all this in the 1980s. So a number of, of works came out from him about the machinic side of human creativity long before AI or even you know, before the wide application of computational creativity. So we could suggest that this algorithmic constitution of humans started long before the Industrial Revolution, or even that it has been foundational to the constitution of the human as a technical being, a being who actuated this humanness in relation with technical objects such as fire, sticks, or stones, here in the image used as weapons or as tools. Humans' everyday functioning also depends on the execution of a different program, a sequence of possibilities enabled by various couplings of adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, otherwise known as DNA. Now, this proposition shouldn't be taken as a postulation of a mindless technological or biological determinism that would remove from humans any possibility of action and any responsibility for the actions we take. Yet accepting our affinity with other living beings across the evolutionary spectrum and recognizing that our human lives are subject to biochemical reactions that we are not fully in control of from blushing through to aging and dying does undermine the humanist parameters of the debate about creativity, art and AI. Disallowing the strict caesura between humans and robots, our supposed genius and artificial intelligence, such a post-human view of the human recalibrates human creativity as partly computational. Once again, to say this is not to resign ourselves to passivity by concluding that humans are incapable of creating anything, that they are nothing but clockwork devices responding to impulses. I'm certainly not saying that. It's only to concede, after Flusser, that just as the imagination of the apparatus is greater than that of all artists across history, the imagination of the program called life in which we all participate, and which is an outcome of multiple processes running across various scales of the universe, far exceeds our human imagination. To understand how humans can operate within the constraints of the apparatus that is part of them becomes a new urgent task for a much needed post-humanist art theory, was the argument I was making in AI art. And I suggested there that in this new paradigm for understanding art and creativity more broadly, the human would be conceived as part of the machine, dispositive or technical system, and not its sole inventor, owner and ruler. A post-humanist art history would see instead the production of all artworks, from cave paintings through to the works of so-called great masters and contemporary experiments with all kinds of technologies as being produced by human artists in an assembly with a plethora of non-human agents, drives, impulses, viruses, drugs, various organic and non-organic substances and devices, as well as all sorts of networks from mycelium through to the internet. The frequently posed question, can computers or robots be creative, which uh, I want to address in this talk, reveals itself in fact to be rather reductive because it's premised on a pre-technological idea of the human as a standalone subject of decision and action. The robot, be it in the shape of a terminator or an algorithm, is only seen here as an imperfect approximation of such a human. Therefore, we are better off asking after Flusser whether the human can actually be creative, or more precisely, in what way can the human be creative? Now, so I think that was kind of a little summary of what I was trying to do with the AI book, which came out in 2020. But I also recognize that things have changed a lot uh, since then. Uh, for example, we've had an Oxford report from Oxford Institute uh, uh, about AI and the arts, um, showing and interviewing a number of machine learning artists, looking at their practices in their studio, trying to figure out what they do, 
capturing some very interesting, fascinating practices and also modes of reflecting on what was going on. There is also a collaboration between Serpentine and King's College London, my department of digital humanities, uh, uh, an institute and, and kind of um, ensemble of people, artists, theorists, engineers who come together to think about what my colleagues Eva Jäger and Mercedes Boons called the back end of AI. So looking at the processes, the technologies, the enabling of the kind of machine learning applied to uh, the artistic domain, but also understanding that we need to um, uh, give an account of the infrastructures involved, of the technologies involved, and also recognize the multiple skills uh, involved of different people involved in the production process, not just those called artists, but also kind of the plethora of other forces specialisms. And we, also, we recently produced a paper, collaborative paper called Creative, Critical, Constructive, Collaborative, Computational, playing with kind of um, uh, communication models, a C5 model for creative AI, which is also free, uh, freely available to download from the Creative AI Org website. Um, so there has also been an, like lots of really interesting, exciting exhibitions. So even though in the AI art, I was a bit rude about some of the works <laughs> or, in the early experiments, I was also hopeful about the possibility of doing something provocative, thought provoking, and not just visually stunning. And obviously lots of artists are delivering on that promise. Lots of curators, including the amazing Irini Papadimitriou, who curated a very smart exhibition called Plasmata in a park uh, in Athens, uh, it was co-organized by Onassis Center in Athens and, and containing a number of really amazing conceptual, visual, um, socio-political projects that dealt with AI and machine learning and the kind of wider context. So there is a lot happening around AI that is exciting. And my current work recognizes the growing maturity of the field. And I also want to move beyond that initial moment of critique to recognize that creative potential of AI, which I understand in terms of non-human creativity. I am mean, predominantly interested in the kinds of questions AI raises for us and the kind of future it forecasts. So the context for this uh, new, new level of inquiry is provided by our wider socio-political horizon for me. One could suggest that we, and by we, I mean he is we the people, we as citizens of so-called democracies, but also we as critics, as philosophers, scholars, artists. So we seem to be quite stuck at the moment, politically, financially, ecologically. Given the state of events, I want to offer a series of provocations. Could we mobilize non-human creativity as a way of opening up our all to human ways of thinking and acting? Can AI play the role of a philosopher visionary that will show us a way out? Could it get beyond the limitations of our human frames of mind to imagine a different set of propositions? Could it actually envisage a better future for humans and non-humans alike while showing us how to get there? history, science fiction, and the current model of extractive capitalism, which repurposes all openings as resources for its own growth, all indicate that this idea is unlikely to succeed. But given how stuck we currently are, it seems worth dreaming up some literally unthinkable visions for our planetary survival and coexistence. Now, film series Janet Harbert suggests that the hope of future salvation rests on the human capacity to mentally imagine, to be affected by the image. As a first step, AI-driven art may therefore become a realm of picturing a better future beyond our wildest human dreams. But AI and ML algorithms put to work in progressive university labs, research and policy centers, and art organizations could also perhaps envisage ways of co-engineering this better future beyond the rigidity of the present modernist paradigm that we seem unable to shake off. So drawing on my philosophical work and my art practice, I want to explore how we can mobilize non-human creativity as a way of opening up our all to human ways of thinking and acting. But what is non-human creativity? Now, one way of answering this question is by suggesting that human creativity has always been partly non-human, that it has always entailed an other-than-human element. 
At the same time, this kind of creative activity still needs to be recognized and valorized as art by individual humans, as well as by human institutions and practices. My attempt to explore the problem of non-human creativity and artificial imagination in this talk will be divided into two parts. In part one, I'll draw on selected works of AI-based art that engage implicitly or explicitly with this proposition about human creativity being partly non-human. In part two, I'll introduce a recent film of mine produced in collaboration with various AI models to illustrate my attempt to perform and not just think about this idea of non-human creativity, while also trying to imagine a better future. Okay, so part one, machinic co-creation. In this picture, we can see a four-wheeled vehicle driving alongside a white wall. During its up and down journeys, it's leaving multicolored squiggles on the wall that look like graffiti. This is a senseless drawing bot by Sokano and Takahiro Yamaguchi, another example of art making robots which have graced the art scene since computation allowed for the removal of the human artist from the visible side of the creative process, if not from its planning, design, and programming. In a similar vein, Leona Mora's robot art uses ensembles of small programmable vehicles that leave colorful ink marks on large sheets of paper in response to cues. Following in the footsteps of their renowned predecessors, such as Jean Tingeli and his kinetic painting sculptures called Menomatics from the 1950s, and Harold Cohen with his painting program Aaron, these new iterations of art making robots go beyond the relatively narrow scope of creative possibilities resulting from the historical limitations of the mechanical systems underpinning them. Using the principles of machine learning, the art-making robots of Kano and Yamaguchi and Mura pick up cues from the environment to come up with novel images, images that their programmers have no ultimate control over. Drawing on complex algorithms of artificial intelligence, which make it impossible to predict the final outcome of the drawing or painting process, those works reboot robot art as a playful, almost childlike pastime and a spontaneous expression of a moving body. Except here, the body is no longer human. With this, the robot's constructors stage the provocative idea of creativity as a domain of more than human activity. Mora goes so far as to claim that whether a work of art is made directly by a human artist or is the product of any other type of process is nowadays of no relevance. More decisive is whether or not a new art form expands the field of art. Since robots like those I use are able to generate novelty, it must also be recognized that they have at least some degree of creativity, says Mora. We could probe further and ask whether these artistic propositions can genuinely be said to withdraw the human artists from the scene, or do they perhaps enact a different, but not any less radical proposition, the possibility of the absence of agency at the heart of the human, of the fact that there is no, no there there, not just an artist, but in all of us. Works of art in which the artist has seemingly been replaced with a robot or computer attract attention because they capture our anxiety with regard to the programmable aspects of reality at the time when algorithms of AI are organizing our lives in so many dimensions. They also raise deeper questions about the humanist concepts that shape our idea of ourselves, such as agency, autonomy, decision-making ability, and free will. In this way, they open up a critical inquiry into the nature of creativity, and into the truncated, perhaps, role of the human in it. The investigation of this problem and of the way it is approached in contemporary media art forms the core axis of my current work. The, philosoph the philosophical premise of my argument is that human creativity has always been non-human, as I mentioned earlier, that it has entailed this other than human element. At the same time, we rely on the recognition of this creative activity as art by human judgment which both arises out of and shapes human institutions and cultural practices. My own position on what I term non-human creativity 
is aligned with a the theoretical standpoint of critical post-humanism, a position which negotiates the pressing question of what it means to be human under the conditions of globalization, technoscience, late capitalism, and climate change. This position doesn't mean any straightforward overcoming of the human, were such a thing even possible, but rather a rewriting or reenactment of the human under the crisis conditions mentioned earlier. So the said crisis is multiple in volume and planetary in scale. Importantly, critical posthumanism doesn't just describe it. It also mobilizes the humans and the planet's fragility as an ethical political demand. Artists today are responding to this demand in a variety of affective registers, from horror, melancholy and mourning, through to irony, parody and play. This reenactment of human subjectivity and agency is often accompanied by an attempt to rethink the role and position of the artist, acknowledging entanglement and co-creation as the ontological condition of existence for us all. Importantly, in many artworks today, the planet is engaged as a partner rather than an object to play with or destroy, bringing in issues of responsibility and care to both art practice and art discourse. Now, speaking of kind of creativity, as a working definition, although not without problems, I'm going to adopt computer scientist Margaret Borden's theorization of creativity as the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising and valuable. Leaving aside for now, the question of how the judgment about the postulated qualities of those ideas and artifacts is to be exercised, Bowden's writings on creativity deserve attention because of her efforts to take computer art and other forms of media art seriously as interventions that can shift established epistemological and ontological frames. She recognizes that some philosophers refuse to admit the possibility of computer art by defining art in exclusively human terms. Antonio here, for example, insists that art involves some form of communication between one human being and another, with artists and audience being required to share human experience. In contradistinction to such explicitly and narrowly humanist views, Bowden acknowledges the possibility of defining art in terms of properties of the art object that are exclusive, not exclusively human, even if she herself doesn't follow through on the investigation of what such non-human art would present, mean, and who it would be addressed to. So the kind of cultural analysis of, of the very kind of ideology of the concept of creativity, its location in different, uh, the discourse of cultural industries, the political dimension of it, that's all missing from Bowden. But I'm kind of bracketing it out for now because I'm intrigued by the possibility of pushing uh, the understanding of art beyond the human, while still trying to figure out how we can do that. I mean, I did this kind of in 2017, I wrote Non-Human Photography, which was an attempt to explore this issue from a slightly different angle, looking at images in an expanded frame from fossils through to QR codes. So that was one way of thinking about this. But this humanist concept of creativity that troubles me and that I'm interested in Borden's critique of, and the seeds of it um, we can find in, in her writings, but this humanist concept has been with us at least since the Renaissance, modeled on the ex nihilo way in which God was supposed to have created the universe, it has found its direct translation in the romantic idea of the human, most often of the male variety, as a standalone genius thinking amazing thoughts and making beautiful artifacts from above the world. Explicit challenges to the humanist model of creativity have recently been issued from many other directions than just computer science or computer-based art. Looking at prehistorical cave drawings and shell carvings, Marcos du Satoy points out that traces of artistic creativity which he defines as making marks with an intention that goes beyond mere utility, can most likely be traced as far back as 500,000 years to our human ancestors, such as Homo erectus and the Neanderthal. This is art created by another species, he says. Artistic expression is believed to have served a binding function with those early communities. 
In evolutionary psychology, the emergence of creativity's outcomes in the form of art is seen as being continuous with the creative processes of other living beings, such as bowerbirds, whose males construct colorful multi-texture lodgings, and marine creatures such as snails, bivalves, and coral polyps, which produce elaborate limescale architectures to serve as their homes. Creativity is exp explained by many scientists as offering a species level advantage, though through enhancing our cognitive faculties or satisfying our supposedly innate desire for symmetry, order and beauty. Now, so there is something interesting going on about this idea of pushing creativity beyond the human, but these functionalist explanations, uh, where it, whether it's just about the evolutionary advantage, they are not satisfactory to me and to lots of other people. For example, philosopher of post-human thought, Claire Colbrook, doesn't mince her words in critiquing this line of thinking. Such an argument is stupid, she writes, not because it's wrong, error, but because it fails to give form to the drives that have generated art. There may be a drive for pattern finding that helps animals to survive, but art is the power to render that drive different from its originating ground, thwarting and perverting patterns generating more complex syntheses. Following this argument, it's not enough for something to look like what we've predefined as art to us humans. Hence all these experiments in getting chimpanzees or elephants to paint and then delighting in their abstractions should just be considered as silly humanist detractions that end up reaffirming the human as the sole arbiter of artistic judgment and sole owner of art as both activity and concept. Colbrook's argument builds on Henri Bergson's idea of creative evolution, where life is seen as an explosive power of creative difference and a counter tendency of resistance. Bergson also emphasizes our tendency to cut up matter and carve out objects from this flow of life, a tendency that is a sense-making strategy enacted by humans. We could therefore say that under certain circumstances, certain groups of living beings recognize these certain acts unfolding across time as art and have through their history created a whole lot of institutions and practices that legitimate those practices in these terms. Colebrook's critical statement shouldn't therefore be mistaken for a postulation of a uniquely human creativity. What she's rather getting at is that the evolutionary functionist explanation of art curtails all too quickly the human ability to recognize something as truly creative. This logic can be seen in the pronouncements of technology companies which promise us creative gadgets that will be absolute game changers while having to rely on the majority of the elements of that game, the capitalist system of exchange, the extractivist logic of overproduction and overconsumption to remain largely the same or even be strengthened in the process. Such arguments by extension with regard to creativity are therefore deeply uncreative. They show a failure of imagination or worse, a willing desire for things not to get too different and hence too creative. This brings us to a concept of creativity as non-functional excess, a breaking through beyond the human and a possibility of the emergence of new sensations and new modes of knowing. And this is indeed a take on the non-human creativity I want to offer in my work. So moving on to the second part of my talk uh, called imagining and or imaging and imagining a better future with AI. So let me now offer you an example from my own practice, which involves a remaking with the help of AI of the 1962 photo film La Jete by French director Chris Marker. Marcus' film serves as an ideal case study for probing the question of non-human creativity because of the knowing embrace of the idea of automatic creation by its maker. The director confessed that the film had been made like a piece of automatic writing. It was in the editing that the pieces of the puzzle came together, and it wasn't me who designed the puzzle. La Jete opens with a slow pan over a photograph of an open air viewing platform, a jetty, at the Orly Airport in Paris. Uh, a short sequence of closely cut images later, we are told by a deadpan narrator that something violent has just occurred. 
So the whole film is made of photographs and it's made in 62. The sequence of images is accompanied by this famous mysterious sounding opening. The first line saying, this is the story of a man marked by an image from his childhood, except it's in French. Uh, we then encounter the said man several years later in Paris, which in the meantime has been destroyed by World War III. Radioactive contamination has pushed all the survivors underground. The man is imprisoned in a medical facility run by an army of German speaking experimenters with an ominous looking director as its head. He's being primed, the man is being primed for time travel. He will need to go into the future to save humanity by finding a hole in time through which to send food energy supplies. Having accomplished his mission, he is no longer needed. He will have to be eliminated. We then realized together with him that the open, opening scene that he was viewing was in fact the moment of his death. So it's all very kind of loopy. Uh, Marcus film, capturing the sense of the material and moral distraction brought on by World War II and a premonition of a nuclear holocaust is both a memory exercise and a lesson in how to remember well. La Jetée's post-apocalyptic tenor and its haunting narrative make it an apt reference point for the current moment of the multiple crises, including current war and uh, the threat of nuclear destruction, uh, in, uh, the climate catastrophe in which our world finds itself in 2023. The COVID-19 pandemic, with its multiple ways of its unequal distribution of mortality and health, is reminiscent of the time loops enacted in La Jetée, whereby the past cuts across the present to leap into the future and then back again. The renewed threat of, of, threat of World War III generates a similar sense of anxiety, but also the premonition of an imminent end to the liberal fantasy of our ways of life coupled with a desire for things to return to how they once were, fuel the imagination of not only climate change deniers, anti-vaxxers and racists, but also of many others who carry a strong mental image of a better yesteryear, even if that image is just a dream. So my experiment consisted in making a nine minute film, the original marker is 30 minutes. So nine minute film called A Gift of the World, Oedipus on the Jetty, by way of an re AI remediation of La Jetée through the socio-political con concerns of the present moment in the face of an apocalyptic crisis. The first step of my project involved training a generative adversarial network, a GAN model called StyleGAN2, on a database of stills extracted from La Jetée. So basically I've you know, taken individual stills using special software from the film, and I trained this model that already existed to give me kind of similar images. GANs are machine learning programs that use two neural networks, algorithms designed in an open-ended manner from the bottom up in a way that is meant to imitate or rather schematize the way the human brain works. So the two neural networks in a GAN are positions at adversaries. That's why they're called adversarial networks. One program to generate convincing and correct input based on what it's been taught to do, you know, the images that it was given or images or text. The other one, trying to control and improve upon this output and uh, upon this input according to the truth falsehood criteria. So one is a generator and one is a discriminator. Uh, their ongoing interaction makes both networks improve with time, learning from each other while trying to up outperform each other in getting good enough results. The GAN model I used had been designed to mimic the style of the images fed into it to train it with a view to generating an infinite amount of similar looking images. I'm going to play now a clip of the film. So as the film is nine minutes, I'm going to play you about nearly three minutes. Um, if it doesn't make much sense, just go with the flow. I'll explain some of the things. Just want to say that the actual film, nine minutes, doesn't make much more sense. So there is something else going there. So anyway. I hope you get the sound. You, have you got the sound? This is the story of a man marked by an image from his childhood. He was the son of a Roman Catholic father and a Catholic mother. His mother was an itinerant widow and he had a sister who was a British officer. 
He had no family and was just a man. He would have thought of the woman as a baby. He was already a soldier, a member of the great army. Now he had lost all his memories. He had lost all the strength he had. He had lost his identity. When he recovers from his trance, the woman is gone, and his mother is gone. He feels the thoughts and feelings of his world, in a world where he is dead. She is, in fact, a gift of the world. He remembers what she said, and he tries to make sense of it. It's an idea he had once experienced. It's a mental phenomenon, he thinks. The conversation is a kind of sexual act. He's on his way to his bedroom to find out if he can talk to the woman who brought him to this world. They are without plans, without memories. They are without focus and without freedom. They are without a choice, without a right. A day goes by and we are on our way, he tells her. A day goes by. I'm waiting for you for you to come with me. You will stay with me, and I will give you your dream. I'm a dreamer, a man, she says, a man who will love you. I'll follow you to the end of your life. You will be my first gift, and I will take you from here. I will have you with me forever, and I will never forget you, and you will be your friend, your God, your father and your father will never forget you, and I will never forget you. He is a dreamer, a man who will love you. Okay, so uh, the script of my film was created with the assistance of GPT-2, an unsupervised AI language model that had been trained on the web text dataset containing millions of web pages. I started by feeding the model um, fa the famous opening line from La Jete. This is the story of a man marked by an image from his childhood. The model responded by taking the story in an unexpected direction. Any edits I did to the script were minor, with some of the language errors identified as important moments in my experiment and hence retained. The editing of the video was intuitive and consisted of my own visual and bodily responses to both the script and the GAN images. Interestingly, the images themselves produced by an algorithm that tried to remake Marcus film by picking up its key visual features and especially those pertaining to humans, as is often the case in such generative programs that have been trained on photos of human faces, manifested various bodily parts, frequently multiplied noses, hair, eyes, kidneys, kidney-like eyes. The way generative neural networks operate is by repeatedly optimizing pixels in an image to achieve some desired state of activations. That desired state is compared against the source material, the training set. Developers frequently resort to the metaphor of a dream to describe the working of neural nets, suggesting that such networks find patterns and images not so much in a logical pre-programmed way, but rather by using previous data and memories as prompts for making new connections between data points and for generating new data. Their operations are presented as being akin to what human minds do while at rest, either when we are asleep or daydreaming. By anthropomorphizing their products, engineers, and the technology companies they work for absolve themselves of the responsibility for their programming decisions and for those decisions' unintended consequences. As mentioned earlier in my AI book, I was very critical about GAN induced creativity, about their seductive yet quite uh, frequently banal visuality. Yet I decided to turn to GANs to produce my own film. This was partly driven by a desire to explore on a practical level the promises and limitations of creativity implied by the generative algorithmic technology at the time when this technology was on the cusp of already being replaced by much more photorealistic AI models such as diffusion, GPT and CLIP. Feeding my model limited visual data, 
I was trying to explore what artist David Young called little AI, highlighting a moment in the technology's development when it's still possible to see errors and glitches, both machinic and social. As a report on AI, AI produced by the Oxford Internet Institute, for which Young was interviewed, I put it, the history of art shows that glitches are often artistically desirable. Machine learning art is no exception to this. While the capabilities of ML models are valued by our respondents, most were particularly interested in their edges, the artistic potential of machine failure. I was also keen to put to the test my own earlier proposition that artworks produced by means of GANs, or indeed any other AI-driven art algorithms or techniques, became more interesting when they executed and acknowledged their paragonal or framing function, invoking their audience to engage not just with the artifacts produced, but also with the narratives about AI and machine vision and about the limits of human creativity and the socio about the sociopolitical role and positioning of art and media production. I was aware that the playful sense of experimentation I had adopted as my method was tinged with the more ominous undertones of the experiments conducted on Marcus' main character in the underground camp. The counter dream aspect was also important for me, given the sociopolitical limitations of AI technology, revealing not only gender and racial bias, but also the exclusionary and unjust logic underlying many of its founding principles, which is why it's not enough to correct the bias, because if you eliminate racial bias and uh, gender bias from AI algorithm, it will make them execute their uh, epistemically violent and, and you know, physically violent often uh, a kind of labor uh, in discriminating against most vulnerable groups and populations. So the elimination of bias would be a first step, but it's not enough in itself. If it's only going to make surveillance or you know, capture of data points or digitization of human subjectivity even more efficient. And so I was curious about what AI would also do to the original source material of Marcus' film, but I also knew I would need to step in as both a dream catcher and analyst. So what happened there is that they, they kind of, with the help of algorithms, we got a gender fluid narrative of survival as dreamt up by the film's director in co-creation with AI algorithm, ending up to the dismantling the, the myth of the male savior in European history. And you know, Marcus film is very much still this kind of masculine story of the savior, a man who goes and rescues. It's like a Marvel comic, but basically for the avant-garde. And this kind of traditional family structure that props it. And it was very interesting here that in my film that the GPT-2 tried to recap recapture that sense of the family structure and was its Oedipal uh, uh, kind of foundation, but it was obviously foundering, was messing up. The model tried to remain faithful and and try to reenact this personal and global apocalypse as an Oedipal drama. The AI engines deployed in the visual and textual models yet produced a more multi-layered show, one that unfolded as, as much on the gender front as it did on the humanist existential one. We could say that the film dreamt itself as a feminist genderqueer intervention into the heteronormative fetishism of the apocalypse as dreamt up in key Western cultural texts from the Bible through to Marcus film. So what starts as a conversation between mother and son in La Jete ends up through a series of algorithmic glitches as a sequence of slippages that enter a gender vortex in which man becomes woman, mother becomes father, he becomes she. With the dissolution of the nuclear family, the Oedipal drama as the structuring device of our cultural script disappears. The sense of premonition still lingers, but it's now accompanied by the possibility of an opening and a liberation. This possibility can be read as a feminist gift, a gift to cite art critic Griselda Pollock of what the feminine can be thought to be if we emerge from the exclusivity of the Oedipal logic of the phallus as the only arbiter of psychic life and signification. So how is that for imagining a different future? So when I was finishing the film, a newer version of the language model called GPT-3 became available, and GPT had been trained on a much larger body of text, generating text that mimic human discourse and conversation more successfully and seamlessly. However, the statistical analysis and the decontextualization issues 
coupled with a philosophical problem of when and to whom a given meaning is actually meaningful didn't disappear in GPT-3. They just became more obscure. The GPT-3 model was then superseded in 2022, late 2022, by a much more potent chat GPT. Everyone is talking about chat GPT now, a model that brought AI composed text to the awareness of the wider public. Working with the visual and linguistic clumsiness of the earlier models, such as GANs and GPT-2, allowed me to capture in my film that short span of time when those technologies were still weird enough to reveal their conditions of existence, their illogics, but also the missed opportunities underpinning their development. Ian Bogost has re remarked that as the novelty of that surprise wears off, it's becoming clear that chat GPT is less a magical wish granting machine that in, than an interpretive sparring partner, a tool that's most interesting when it's bad rather than good at its job. Given the push to implement creative AI in routine products such as search engines, word processors, and image manipulation software, not to mention vast areas of the already banalized content creation, there will soon come a time when the algorithmicity of our behavior merges even more seamlessly, seamlessly with that of AI-enabled models. It is therefore understandable that artists want to test and tease these models while we can see and still enjoy the glitch. The implicit obsolescence of those models is the feature of those artworks, including of my own project discussed today. So working with the good enough visual and textual models of 2021 allowed me to capture a particular moment in time when the AI-driven technology was revealing its uncanniness quite explicitly, thus lending itself more easily to artistic experimentation. It may be that it was a unique moment in time when both human agency and human intervention into the AI-fueled perception machine were still possible before the weirdness of AI on both textual and visual levels would have been overcome by successful stochastic mimicry, thus making critical interventions into the technology and its underpinning logic more difficult to stage or even argue for. Yet I want to believe that this moment is still with us, offering us in a Flusserian vein, a small margin of freedom where we can imagine and enact things to be otherwise from within the algorithmic system that is closing around us. And okay, thank you very much. And I think I'm going to stop here. A lot of these works are referenced on my Instagram. I'm not very social. I joined social media like 15 years later than everyone else, but I've started using Instagram as a kind of visual philosophical kind of diary recording space. So anyone stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Joanna, for this wonderful lecture uh, and for offering us so many insights and opening so many new questions. Um, I would like to start um, with a question I actually prepared earlier, um, and it kind of uh, relates to what you just said in the end uh, about um, being at that point in time when we can still use its creative potential. So um, in your book, AI Art, you did touch upon the parallel between uh, net art, post-internet art and AI art. So uh, from, as you said, from the time your uh, AI art book was published until today, a lot has happened. Uh, we are way past uh, digital decoration AI art, let's say, uh, and there are so many new critical artworks that are uh, coming up. So um, can you, uh, from today's perspective, again, um, take a look at uh, this parallel? Uh, in relation, so I think in terms of um, kind of net art as well, there was also a certain spirit of uh, openness of the resource, or kind of working more collaboratively, a spirit of kind of reimagining things and imagining what's possible. And maybe I think a lot of artists are also kind of coming to the tools of kind of AI, but also working with open kind of coding models, with open kind of programming, with open source, um, to also open up 
conceptual possibilities for imagining different ways of kind of being with AI, of being with that kind of technology, of cutting through the smoke and mirror. And obviously to, to get to grips to this, with this technology requires some level of expertise, requires some time. People need to train themselves in using things and understanding how things work. But I think there is a lot in terms of the parallel with net art. It would be, I think, in that spirit of also trying to build communities. There are a lot of people who are working more collaboratively, like it was in net art, who are asking questions of their technology. So it's kind of they're executing that paragonal function where the artwork by itself, it's not this kind of, you know, a beautiful object to be appreciated or sold at price. It's also a part of a conversation. It's a discourse. It's an intervention. It's a certain strategy of, you know, doing things otherwise with AI when AI you know, self, a metaphor, of course, is becoming kind of more embedded into our everyday lives. So it's almost, you could see it as this kind of glitch or noise making, which is also, uh, you know, common to all those earlier forms of, of you know, te technological art, where artists were a bit more openly kind of social, political and critical. Thank you. I have a couple of more questions, but uh, I will leave them for the end uh, if there's still time left. And I would like to invite uh, everyone present to uh, ask questions to yeah, Joanna. Uh, I don't see any hands raised, but you can just. Oh, okay, Vera. Madam, please. Thank you, Jelena. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Vera Meverach. I am also part of the DigiLab of the Institute of Philosophy and Social Theory. And uh, thank you, Professor Zhilinska, a lot for this lecture. So I actually have a um, continuation maybe of Jelena's uh, question. I apologize, by the way, for my video, for my camera. It's actually maybe in line with the glitch uh, aesthetics. Um, so maybe I'll turn it off for better. Yeah. Uh, so my question would be, when we're discussing this connection between net art and uh, AI art today, and you talked about this um, spirit of openness, which which I agree they share, but I also uh, myself thought about this issue in the question of democratization of art. So uh, I wanted to ask you uh, if we approach the issue of AI art from its, uh, its like uh, the way it is being criticized, uh, do you do you feel there is a connection to maybe this kind of uh, discourse on one side of democratization of art in the sense of just uh, surpassing the idea of art and going back to creativity as such, and on the other hand about uh, maybe this is not the word you used. Uh, regarding the the, the uh, economy or creative industries in spe specifically. So how much do you feel that, okay, I see you got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, I think that issue of democratization is obviously very much on the table now, and it's also evoking a lot of anxiety amongst, uh, you know, both kind of creative industries, like people think if everyone can generate themselves uh, images or art, uh, does it mean that we don't need artists anymore? And obviously, well, the problem of elimination of, of you know, certain positions of labor, I mean, is undoubtedly linked to some of these forms of so-called AI creativity. I mean, we've already seen that with journalism because you know, people have used automated copy for a long time and they're gonna use it much more often now. You know, designers have been using kind of AI generated backgrounds for computer games for a long time. They're going to use it even more now for theater, for other areas. So that implementation is obviously going to happen and it will have economic consequences. But in terms of the democratization of art, um, I'm kind of not sure about, about that. Because on the one hand, you know, lot, everyone can go on to DALI too. No, no, log in and, and generate some pictures. Obviously, that doesn't yet make it art. I think it creates a situation where people need to be asked, uh, you know, need to kind of start asking questions like who is art for? Why do we do it? What do we do it for? And I think the 
cultural kind of avant-garde and institutions like like yours, like you know, mine, those I work with both universities and galleries, have been at the forefront of, of kind of asking these questions. And and but these questions often come from the media community, people like media users. There's also that kind of democratization also comes with a certain um uh, requirement for for a different form of of know-how because obviously if we are just going to apply ready-made models i mean at some point people will get bored i mean lots of people i think you know now like week four of hype and many people are already bored with chat gpt because they've seen enough uh, errors enough and they've seen okay this is the logic of this so i think we're going to see democratization but then uh, like with net art it also a certain level of know-how was required to produce things. You needed to be able to understand the infrastructures at the time. You needed access to technology, you needed knowledge, but also some of these communities, they were you know, not always very open as well. And sometimes in gender terms, sometimes in terms of the, you know, the cool kids doing bits of coding. And there is a danger of that returning today, the kind of, you know, coders versus non-coders, people who are doing this particular type of work. So I think there are other forms of access and lack of access that are enabled and disabled. Something is definitely going to shift. But, you know, the same way that people thought, well, painting is going to die when photography came onto the scene. And obviously we know painting hasn't died, both as an object of investment or as a mode of expression. The same photography didn't die with a digital or some people are still worrying, will photography disappear today? Uh, because we can generate photographs from scratch without requiring light. But again, it probably won't, but something is shifting. And these shifts are cultural, political, economic, and they require a lot of, I think, intellectual resources to analyze them all separately. So some of them, depending where you stand, if you've got investment in some, you know, shares in some company, I think what's well, terrible, it's happening to, to certain old forms of image making. Uh, if you are, you know, excited about possibility of creating something, and I say, oh, this is exciting, let's go and see. But I think they require anchored analyses, be it in terms of political economy or political theory, or kind of social issues or kind of you know race and gender theory, depending on which issues we address. So as with everything else, the answer is it's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If, if I may, and and um, it, how how would you address then the creative industries aspect? Mm -hmm. I I heard there was very interesting criticism coming from the art world. It was like uh, people are very angry that this came from the Silicon Valley, which yeah. had absolutely no uh, uh, reflection on what creativity or art should be. Mm -hmm. And this really got me thinking in this direction that we are seeing not only in this uh, like very uh, um, uh, feet to the ground issues of work of uh, of uh, of uh, systems, but uh, that we are seeing a, a push uh, or a further disappearance or or weakening of the art of the art world or art system, and that creative industries in this uh, in a discurs discursive sense play a role in this. Well, I think that that is only happening if we allow Silicon Valley to own the creativity discourse and to kind of claim that, oh, yes, now we, we've, you know, we've hacked creativity. Nobody needs that anymore because, you know, everyone has access. And it's a misunderstanding fundamentally that idea of the kind of generation of certain force field, if you like, you know, the question of what art is for. And obviously we've been asking this question, so it's not just about generation of pretty pictures or even unpretty pictures, but it's about obviously other ways of, of kind of sensing, feeling, affecting, and creating certain communities of meaning in which something matters, something is important. Um, so I think it's important for, for critics, for writers, for artists themselves, to kind of claw back the, the discourse of creativity, the understanding of that and think, you know, a lot of artists, I mean, people don't become artists unless you're Jeff Koons because you want to be rich, but you become, and although I don't think artists should be remunerated and I want to live in a society in which art still matters, isn't just seen either as a pastime for rich kids or something just so marginal that it's important. So I do, and I think your question is very important in the sense that it might point to a very, um, 
uh, evil, I think, I don't know, evil is not part of my vocabulary, but a malicious uh, undertaking on part of Silicon Valley, and be it conscious or unconscious, I don't know, but trying to diminish the forms of living that matter to a lot of people that are still difficult to commercialize, that are kind of like, uh, you know, about opening up possibilities of living differently. So that's happened as well around universities with the discourse of STEM, when people have been told for like, you know, 10, 15 years now that humanities don't matter and that you're not going to get a job when you graduate with a humanities degree, even though we know this is not true. Actually, people with humanities degrees, you know, have as much a chance of getting a kind of good enough job as graduates of the multiple, you know, computer science courses or, uh, or, or psychology degrees, which are both huge. And I have nothing against psychologists or computer scientists, of course. But it's just that this causes the STEM industry, which is also a political discourse, comes from not just from uh, you know, engineering or science or, or Silicon Valley, but comes from governments that think humanities uh, graduates are difficult. They're asking difficult questions. They just go and do revolutions. Why do we? So it's retraining the population in that. So you could see that gesture of trying to almost like hack art. We've disrupted art now because we've shown you what it is. Um, the, you know, by Silicon Valley as precisely an attempt to divert people's attention from those uh, forms of living alternative lives. But at the same time, because that pronouncement and that gesture in some way so stupid, even though it garners a lot of attention, I think it's kind of easy to debunk by artists, theorists, creators, writers, to just say, no, you haven't, you've done something, you know, and it's great to have killed Kim Kardashian, you know, eating a banana, riding an elephant, but that, you know, ain't yet what art is. And maybe we don't yet know what art can be. And that's why it's kind of exciting for those of us to whom these things matter. Thank you a lot. Okay. So we are the resistance. <laughs> Someone has to do it, you know. Hard yeah. to help, but... um, we have um, one question uh, in the comments uh, from Mikhail uh, Buktoyarov. Uh, do you expect legal or ethical limitations imposed on AI art in the future? Will AI art increase the freedom of expression? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think kind of AI art by itself probably won't decrease, increase or decrease anything. So I don't think, well, I'll, I don't think, I mean, it's hard to tell, but I don't think it's by itself has the potential to increase the freedom of expression. But I'm very interested in the first question as well about the kind of legal or ethical limitations imposed on AI art uh, or an AI kind of more broadly in the future. Uh, when you think about the role of AI ethics, because people are talking about AI ethics, and I'm quite suspicious of that discourse of AI ethics, because very often it's used by companies that are trying to, you know, get themselves off the hook. So they are trying to do quite unethical things, be it around data, you know, data collection or manipulation of our data or the selling of data points or marketization of our identity or, you know, sucking um, energy and capital out of every aspect of our lives, but they think they'll get an ethicist on board who will check, no, this is all ethical. So I don't see how AI ethics would be so different from you know, ethics full stop, except we know that ethics by itself doesn't work, as in, you know, in a sense of, you know, moral pronouncements. So normative ethics as such, uh, unless worked out the kind of uh, through societies and cultures uh, codified through years or centuries, but as a certain set of principles, it doesn't work. So what, but what does work is policy. So I actually do believe in policy work. You know, the European Union has actually been doing quite interesting work around regulation of kind of data capture and regulation of AI. And, uh, and I think, you know, I remember Google being quite horrified and saying, why do you want to stop all of this? This is so amazing, this is great, all this, you know, and, you know, Europeans are so afraid. But there is that recognition. So I think policy work could actually go and stop some of the excesses of this kind of Wild West approach to data, to generativity, to so-called creativity, where, you know, kind of the extractivist model. And I do believe that it should be regulated. And so that legal, the legal side, alongside the policy side, I think are very important in that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. We have um, a question from Alexei uh, Estifeyev. 
Uh, hello, thank you so much for the lecture. And like, like so uh, there was a question already about the democratization, but actually what about inequalities? Because one thing I have noticed like from my own experience of just last one month, um, like, uh, a month ago, I've relocated from St. Petersburg, Russia to Serbia. And the thing is that while being there uh, at my home base, I did not have an access, for example, to chat GDP. As soon as I got a Serbian number and I could process this double step verification, claiming that actually I am not now on the, that side of the border, but here, I immediately got an access and you know what? I now find it a very useful tool, improving sometimes like some different styles of writing that I do. Really, it makes much better work than Google Translate in some cases, so like correcting some mistakes that I might have not been a native speaker in my English writing. Yeah. That actually improves my position and really gives me an access to a tool that saves like maybe a quarter of the time that I could have spent checking and double checking and triple checking my writings, etc., etc., and this does not come from an AI as a natural thing, but from more about the implications of those stakeholders who decide who have an access and who has not, and why. And the question is, so, okay, we know that these inequalities, they are produced mostly in human, like, world and social different things, but, like, once again, these people need somehow to educate themselves, to understand what's going on. And is it a must for those people who are in charge of those decisions to educate themselves here? And maybe you know anything about these processes that are maybe already going on there? Because like, actually, probably I'm just taking up the knowledge. So I'd be really grateful for you for, for the command. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, the, the pro I think in terms of access and inequality, like I'm sure, you know, obviously, given the current uh, political situation and obviously Russia's attack on Ukraine, it's understandable why there are issues around access, which are less to do with inequalities probably and more with political or policy decisions taken by states and organizations around access. So I don't think that's necessarily a question of inequality in this particular context, a question of political decisions by certain you know, states or uh, companies, organizations that they are withdrawing their access. But the broader question of access that you are raising is of course very important. And I share your, um, understanding and even pleasure of using kind of GT, you know, GPT chat sometimes because it does things quicker. I was meaning to do a certain document, a policy document for something. And I did that and I did it quickly. And then I, uh, you know, kind of tidied it up, but started a process. But the same way like spell check appeared or calculators appeared, people thought, well, the generation will be stupid. Nobody will count, but people did. You just stopped having to do something. You do something else. Spell check appeared and there was like a big scandal. Oh, nobody will be able to spell anymore. But so I think GPT chat and other you know, newer versions will probably become a form, this aid, a technical aid in doing something. And in that sense, obviously there is a question of access because some of them will become also a monetized product. But at the same time, like these days, we are not worried so much about access to, uh, I mean, there's still obviously a lot of research around access to digital technology, uh, but there is, you know, in the same way that access to certain services and products is available on a freemium model where some of the work is kind of widely available and because uh, we are becoming the free lunch for the companies that are offering that then it's obviously uh, uh then th you know that kind of availability i think the entry point for some of these will be very low but the cost of that might be bigger for us as a society so in a sense what are we giving up if we are giving access, because obviously all the data, all the desires, all the fantasies, all the exercises, including your, you know, school projects, work projects, life projects, love letters you might write to someone, uh, kind of become part of that database, and that's a huge issue. What would the result in the fact that rich people become richer, poor people become poorer in this case, because those who have already an access because they are technological skills, because they are like the habitual usage of informational technologies as the IT community, for example, uh, like and taking into account the symbolic borders, because like I'm not sure that every people, person who I ask who is not habitual with such digital practices would start trying. Mm -hmm. Like, why not even knowing the possibility of these, like, perfect outcomes that, that, that they could gain? 
Well, I think the question of, of wealth, absolutely, but is, and I think, you know, when we've seen the consolidation of wealth in the world now, and I think the tech companies have been in the lead as well globally around that and around creating inequalities. So absolutely. But I think in terms of the, and I'm, I'm not naive about this thing, you know, everyone will have access, the world will be a better place. I think a lot of people will have access. I don't think that the, the world will necessarily be a better place through having that access. But but uh, the barriers, because some of these products become so popularized when they are kind of taken up by mainstream media, when they are being talked about, when it becomes, uh, I mean, like Microsoft is introducing uh, a version of GPT chat. They just paid a billion to the company, didn't they? So, and they're going to introduce this as part of the of their edge uh, search engine. So that's, you know, in a way it won't require any skill, like almost everyone, and obviously I'm using the quotation marks here, but you know, if you have a laptop and if you have a Windows machine, you will have Edge pre-installed usually, because that's it comes gift of Microsoft. And then it will just produce that kind of, you know, search for you. So I think there is a lot of operation, oper operationalizing of making it available to everyone, whether they ask or not, the same way like Google at some point appeared as a search engine. And I still remember days when we did other things. I think it's going to be like that, but I still think this is not necessarily a moment for celebration. So yeah, you're amazing. Everyone has access to these things. I think it's interesting, but obviously there are, I think, socio-political consequences as well. Uh, but I, in terms of what this means for us, to for our imagination, for our cognitive horizons, for our knowledge to be organized by, by, by those companies in that particular way. And through the databases whose creation we don't really have you know, account of, understanding of. Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, do we have more questions? Um, no, okay. Um, okay, I would just uh, like to a second um, come back to a question that I had um, uh, throughout your work uh, not only in AI art but also in uh, minimal ethics for the anthropocene for example uh, you're constantly decentering the human like putting the human uh, into a broader network, let's say, or to quote, uh, rescaling, uh, you want us to rescale our human worldview to recognize our entanglement with creatures and machines. And uh, to come back to the AI art, you said that the shift is going on. So it might be too much to say like a paradigm shift, but something is uh, definitely shifting. So uh, can, um, not only AI art, but generally AI tools, let's call them that, uh, kind of speed up this change in perception of um, human position and human creativity in in a wider context, network well, I context. I think I think they can, and I think I'm already seeing it as a, this just how my brain works, but seeing it as a kind of dual change, uh, the the a dual kind of set of of circumstances. One is the stuff around the climate crisis, which has brought to the fore the issue of human fragility. So in a way, the human cut, you know, being cut to size in our own amazingness, you know, suddenly uh, it's, you know, through the realization of the horizon of extinction and what's happening. I think that coupled with the developments around AI, I think it's another track through which that could occur as well. When we recognize that perhaps what we understood as creativity is a certain kind of way of patterning, modeling, that also functions is machine that is possible to be modeled in machines. But again, because I'm I'm kind of very much with Flusser on that, as in I don't necessarily need to retain this idea, yes, but humans are still special. I mean, I kind of like humans and I'm interested in them. I also am aware that the gesture of cutting the human to size is being performed by a human female identified philosopher. So there is a paradox in that, you know, and can't unthink myself and humanize myself from that. And also that there and the reason reasons for cutting the human for si to, to size for me I was political ethical rather than just as being an intellectual or nihilistic exercise so the, that sense of uh, asking questions of the human I think can be you know and, and AI can speed this up but I can also see 
And I'm aware that I'm just doing this kind of marginal philosophical debate that you know sometimes requires a lot of unpacking to explain what I really mean. And I don't want to get rid of all humans, but it's very easy for this language to be picked up by the kind of transhumanist community saying, yay, we are like moving to Mars and we are becoming better humans. You know, why don't we just grow additional pair of eyes, wings, you know, coding fingers and all turn ourselves into fully data points and discard the body. So that is certainly not what I'm doing with that. But I can sometimes, it's kind of almost surfing too close to the wind and seeing that these two positions, which are opposite, absolute opposite when it comes to a ethical political drive behind them can become collapse. So I don't want to go down the post-humanist or kind of transhumanist or uncritical post-humanist route in the sense of, you know, in the sense of, yeah, yeah, let's just move on to the next stage. Because I don't know, there might not be a next stage. So we should be careful what we wish for. Right, thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions. Uh, Question in the chat as well. In, in the chat, oh yeah, sorry. Language models can produce countless versions of the same text adapting to the reader's needs. Will we be able to cite such text? Is there any point in citing something that's uniquely produced? Or... Yeah, I mean, obviously they are hugely interesting questions and I don't think we've got answers to this as yet. Um, but, you know, who will be the author? And are these texts really, you know, generated from scratch, from nothingness, or they are just generated from human conversations, from human texts anyway, that have existed? And obviously we are dealing with this at the university. We're having committees about, you know, should we stop essays? Is there any point in writing essays? Or should we just do different assessments? So at the moment, nobody has answers to these questions and we could do them, you know, I think the idea is not to ban, G you know, chat GPT, because, you know, we might as well try and ban radio, ban calculators, and I think that's gone. So it's just to think, how do we understand their conditions of working, how we incorporate them and, uh, you know, how we give an account of that. And I don't think the idea is to just invent uh, some software that will check, is it real human or not? Because otherwise, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who will be trying to sell us these kind of new Turing tests uh, around, around some of that. But I don't think that will work. And it's going to, it's much, I think it requires certain maybe reassessment of the debate of what you know education is for, what the you know university is for, what writing is for. I mean, there's lots of opportunists now, people writing all these books with you know uh, chat GPT and others and selling them like on Amazon for you know like a pound or a dollar a copy, but like you know, zillions and trying to make a quick buck. I mean, but there is always like tricksters, shysters and opportunists, and you know, that's fine. But in a broader questions, I don't think we know yet the moment and I think it's great for a lot of different people to be at the table so that you know uh, and that includes policymakers ethicists uh, you know politicians but also artists students young people who are kind of living with digital technology so yeah yeah it remains uh, not open question but uh, open venture basically absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah all right, so, um, yeah, okay. Um, if there are no more questions, maybe we can close this session. If you agree, Joanna, if you have anything else to add. No, to no, thank you very much. Thank you for the questions and the discussion and for being here. So. Thank you very much uh, for, um, for your lecture and for agreeing to be part of our lecture series and uh, i will follow up with you with a link when the lecture is online so thanks uh, to everyone who joined us and yeah see you at the next lecture on 16th of march at 5 p.m thank you bye bye